Welcome to Parts of Speech with Nicole's Language Academy. Now, as many of you are probably ESL learners, um, although some of you may not be, I will do my very best to speak slowly and clearly, but please feel free at any time in the video to pause the video, go back, and play something over again if you don't understand it. Um, and there will be times where I will prompt you to pause the video to do some practice or some kinds of answer some kinds of questions to ensure that you've understood the concepts I've just covered, okay? So please feel free to do that at any time. And then later on, I will give you the answers as well. So first of all, what are parts of speech? What does that mean? Parts of speech are all of the words that we use in writing and speaking, and these words belong in their own categories. So each word can fit into one of the categories that are listed on this slide. One of the categories that is listed on this slide. So the parts of speech are noun, adjective, verb, adverb, pronoun, determiner, preposition, and interjection. You have probably heard of a number of these parts of speech before, but we're gonna go into a lot more detail today about what they actually mean. So let's start with some nouns. We need nouns to make sentences, right? So here are some nouns. There are a number of different kinds of nouns, which we will cover, but let's start with common nouns and proper nouns. What's the difference? A common noun is a general noun, not specific. A proper noun is specific, one thing or person or place. So to review, a noun is usually a person, place, or thing, or animal. Um, and we know that they're nouns because we can make them plural. So for example, we can add S or ES to the end of a word to make it plural. So you can see here on my slide um, that we have, sorry, give me a second, that we have some examples, right? girl, girls, dog, dogs, we can add, right? City, cities, car, cars. So this means we know that it's a noun. Now, of course, in English, there has to be an exception to the rule. So we have something in English called uncountable nouns or non-count nouns, which I will also go over in this presentation. These nouns cannot be made plural without the addition of some unit of measurement or uh, some kind of counter, if you will. But generally speaking, nouns can be made plural. How else do we know if something is a noun? Well, we know it's a noun if a determiner can precede it. So what's a determiner? We'll talk about that as well. But things like articles, the or a, are considered determiners. Um, demonstratives are also considered determiners. So this, that, these, those, right? So if we can put one of those words in front of the word in the sentence, like this, the cat, that dog, then we know that that word is a noun. Um, articles as well, like the and a uh, can precede it, a car, a girl. And we can use possessive adjectives in front of it. For example, my cat or her dog. We can also use adjectives to describe nouns. That's the main purpose of an adjective. So if we have an adjective in front of a noun or um, describing a noun using the verb to be, then we know that that must be a noun. So for example, brown hair, tall man. That's a lot of information. But here's why I'm giving you all that information. Because there are some words in the English language that can sometimes be a noun and can sometimes be an adjective or another part of speech. For example, colors like pink, right? I can say 
pink is my favorite color, right? And if I say pink is my favorite color, pink is now a noun. It can't be made plural because we can't really have pinks. I mean, I suppose we could have shades of pink, right? So this is an uncountable noun where we could talk about shades of pink as being more than one pink. Um, but pink is something, it's a thing in this case, right? Um, and I can describe the pink. I can say light pink is my favorite color, or I can say uh, neon pink, right? Um, or I don't like neon pink or something like this. So all of these um, kind of descriptors that I'm giving you are ways to help you identify a word in a sentence. Now pink, like I said, can also be used as, sorry, pink can also be used as an adjective. I just wanna move this somewhere that I have more space. Um, so for example, we could say, mm, the pink book belongs to Anna. Right, so now pink is describing book. In this case, book would be the noun and pink would be an adjective describing book. So it's very hard to say that one specific word in the English language is always a particular part of speech. It can change sometimes. And this is why I'm giving you all of these other descriptors because in the given sentence, in a given sentence that you have, um, the word may be a noun and it may be an adjective. It may be a verb and it may be a noun. It, you have to really look at the word in the sentence, in the context that it's being used to know for sure if it's a noun or a verb or an adjective, etc. So I'm giving you lots of other ways. Yes, you can first and should first, first ask yourself person, place, animal, or thing, but then also, can it be made plural? Can I describe it with an adjective? Um, can I put a determiner or article in front of it and it still makes sense in that given sentence, okay? So this is kind of some of the other things that we use to help us um, know if something really truly is a verb or adjective or any other part of speech. Okay, so proper nouns then are specific nouns. So instead of saying a person, we say a mira. Instead of saying a place, like a country, we say Seoul. Seoul is a city, but you know what I mean. Instead of saying a car, we say Ford Escape, very specific car, right? So all of these proper nouns, the first letter of each word in the proper noun must be capitalized to show that it's specific. They can also be made plural because they are still nouns. For example, how many Ford escapes are there on the lot, right? Some of them can't be made plural because they're too specific. For example, Seoul is a city. There is only one city named Seoul in the world, right? So we can't say how many souls are there because there is only one. However, for people's names, like Amira, there could be more than one person named Amira, right? So we could say, oh, how many Amiras are there in the classroom? And that would still make sense. So here's a fun little activity. Which of the following nouns listed on this slide are common nouns and which are proper nouns? Can you find them? So you can pause the video here and decide, make a list of which are common nouns and which are proper nouns. And then on the next slide, when you press play again, there will be the answers. And here are the answers. How many did you get right? So let's talk a little bit more about the count versus uncountable or non-count nouns. Count nouns can be counted. That's why they're called count nouns. So you can have one dress, two dresses, three dresses, etc. But non-count nouns or uncountable nouns cannot be counted. Things like air, bread, rice, or even nouns that are always plural, like glasses 
or pants, okay? For these nouns, we can usually count them if we use a specific unit of measurement or some kind of counter, like I said earlier. For example, we can have one loaf of bread. We could have or give a piece of advice. We could have a grain of rice. We could have a pair of glasses or a pair of pants, right? So this is our way of counting uncountable or non-count nouns. So let's give it a try. Can you make the non-count nouns in the following sentences plural by using the appropriate modifying word? Some of them, um, I've given you words and brackets at the end to help you decide which word to use uh, because it wasn't kind of made clear in the context of the sentence. So give it a shot and make sure you pause the video here to try and then we will have the answers on the next slide. And here are the answers. So for number one, Sam's daughter knocked over the bowl of rice. Now he must sweep up millions of grains of rice, not millions of rices. I have way too much homework this week. How will I ever finish? So we have the words many and much, which are kind of like quantifiers, which I'll talk about later. Many is used for countable nouns, right? I have many bags. I have many chairs. I have many elastics. Um, much is used for a non-count or uncountable noun. So too much homework because we can't say too many homeworks. Mary's mother decided to make six loaves of bread because some of the family was coming over for dinner. There are way too many clothes or items of clothing in my closet. Both are acceptable. So clothes, again, is a word that is always plural. Um... So it actually works with many because it is plural, right? So it is a, a word that is always in the plural form. So we can say too many clothes. However, if you want to use a like a counter or unit of measurement for this word, we would say items of clothing because we can't say closes, closes, <laughs> right? That wouldn't make any sense. Can you please bring a couple of bottles of water to the park when you come? We forgot to bring beverages and it's a very hot day. So it could have been bottles of water. It could have been cans of water if you have cans where you're from. It could have been cups or glasses of water. Uh, maybe if you're stopping at a restaurant to pick them up. All of those are acceptable. But some unit of measurement in like a container in which you can place the water. So how do we identify nouns in a sentence? So here I'm gonna annotate a little bit while I'm talking to you guys. Hopefully I get the hang of it now. Um, but there are six balls in the bag. So we have balls in, in bold and bag in bold because these are nouns. How do we know they're nouns? Well, the first question we ask ourselves is, is it a person, place, thing, or animal? A ball is a thing. A bag is a thing. So already we know these could be nouns, okay? But we have to make sure because remember, pink is also a thing. A color is a thing, but can also be used as an adjective, right? So we need to really look at the sentence and say, okay, is it being used as a noun in the sentence? Well, what are some of the other questions we can ask ourselves? Can we put a determiner or an article in front of them? there are six balls in the bag. Well, if there weren't six, let's say there was one, we could say there is a ball in the bag. We could say there are those balls in the bag, right? So that works. And we actually have a determiner, an article right here for bag, right? There are six balls in the bag. So it's already looking pretty much like these are definitely nouns. We also have um, made this word plural. Balls is plural, right? There are six balls in the bag. So again, another check mark that it's probably a noun. Can we make bag plural? Yeah, we could say there are six balls in those bags or there are six balls in two bags, right? So we could definitely make it plural. 
Asking ourselves all of these questions means that we're confirming for sure these words are nouns in the sentence. My friend Molly has two cats and one dog. Well, Molly has a capital, right? She is a proper noun. She is a specific person. And what does she have? She has two cats and one dog. Again, cats has been made plural, so pretty good chance that it's a noun. Dog can also be made plural. It could be true that she has two dogs or three dogs, right? And we have these words in front that are acting as adjectives. They're um, quantifiers, but they're acting as adjectives telling us how many cats and how many dogs, right? So we actually have pretty clear evidence that these are also nouns. My dad wants to purchase 10 fish and place them in an aquarium in our living room. Again, dad is a person, fish is an animal, aquarium is a thing, living room is a place, okay? Um, technically speaking, the noun for living room would be room. This is really a noun phrase, which I don't want to confuse you with. But because living room colloquially is often referred to as one word, even though it's separated, it's actually two words in writing, we wouldn't call the living room anything other than the living room, right? Um, it's that's the name for the room, uh, kind of like how bedroom is the bedroom, but bedroom is one word. So bedroom itself is a noun. Living room, when we write it down, is actually two words. So technically speaking, living is an adjective describing which type of room, the living room. Again, I made it a noun in this case to kind of for colloquial speech that we do use this in speech as one word, one term, kind of similar to bedroom or bathroom, living room, right? But if you want to get technical about it, grammarians don't hate me, I am also a fellow grammarian, technically living would be um, an adjective describing which type of room since it is two separate words in this case. But again, each of these is preceded by some kind of um, article or determiner, uh, quantifier, something that describes which or who, right? Which dad, my dad, how many fish, 10 fish, an aquarium, our living room, right? So all of these um, help us to understand that these words are indeed nouns. Now, fish, we don't generally say fishes. Fish is one of those funny nouns that remains the same in both singular and plural, um, kind of like moose, right? You can have one moose, 10 moose, five moose. Um, and that is just kind of the English language. Um, moving on, we have King Arthur is famous because his knights sat at a round table. So King Arthur, again, is a person. It is a proper noun because we're talking about one specific person, King Arthur. Again, if you want to get into technicalities, um, King is a title given to Arthur. Uh, however, this title that's given to him is often attached to his name. People will not call him Arthur because it would be considered rude. So he is always called King Arthur. That is now kind of part of his name. And that is why it becomes part of the proper noun. Knights um, can be made plural. Which knights? His knights. And they sat at a round table. They could have sat at two round tables. Round is an adjective describing the table. Again, helping us understand that table is in fact a noun. Knight is a noun and King Arthur is a noun. Mother purchased three loaves of bread. Now, here's where it gets interesting. So mother, uh, in this case, a mother is a common noun, right? Everybody has, or not everybody, everybody has had, I should say, a mother, because we don't know if, unfortunately, a mother has passed or et cetera, et cetera, right? But everyone has had a mother. A mother has birthed everyone on this planet. 
Um, so mother is technically a common noun. However, mother is also a title and name given to someone who is a mother. My children call me mom or mother, not Nicole, right? So in this case, um, mother is being used as a proper noun, as a name for someone, as a name for me, for example, and therefore we would capitalize it. It is also at the beginning of the sentence, so it would be capitalized anyway, but even in the middle of the sentence, in this case, if I'm referring to mother as the name for that person, then we would capitalize it because it would be a proper noun. That's her title, that's her name. And then she purchased three loaves of bread. So loaves is that lovely unit of measurement that we're using for bread, which technically a unit of measurement is a thing, right? Kilometer is a unit of measurement for how, how much distance, and we can have more than one kilometer um, and these kinds of things, right? So it is still a noun. Bread itself is also a noun because it is a thing that we eat, right? Uh, but it is an uncountable or non-count noun, and therefore we use the unit of measurement loaf or loaves of bread. You could also use buns, you know, like the small kind of circular bread you might see, or like a, if you're Italian, a panini, right? Like the kind of longer ones. Those are also kind of counters for bread or different kinds of bread. So those would work as well. But I think, I think it's safe to say in most Western countries, it's, um, more common to hear loaves of bread than, than paninis, for example. So now you try. Where are the nouns in the following sentences? Sophia's laptop broke, so she took it to Apple to get it repaired. Justin's cat likes to chase mice in the backyard. How many books do you think there are in the library? There are many reptiles and amphibians at Reptilia. You can see lizards, snakes, frogs, and even alligators. So ask, yourself, ask yourselves the questions and see if you can identify the nouns in the following sentences. Please pause the presentation here to answer the questions. And once you hit play again, you will get the answers. Dun, da, 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 answer time. So in purple, we have all of the answers. However, I am going to give you another technicality. So I think it's really important for people to know um, whether you're a native speaker or whether you're uh, English as a foreign or English as a second language learner, the technicalities of the language, right? Um, so an interesting fact here is that Sophia's and Justin's in sentences one and two are actually functioning as adjectives in the sentence because we're describing which or whose laptop, which or whose cat, right? So um, we're actually describing the noun laptop and the noun cat by saying Sophia's laptop or Justin's cat. However, being proper nouns, so being inarguably or unarguably, <laughs> um, a person, right? Sophia is a person. Justin is a person, which is, you know, people are nouns. Um, they they kind of maintain some of their nounness. So you would not be wrong per se in saying that Sophia and Justin are proper nouns. Uh, in this case, they are proper nouns functioning as adjectives in the sentence, if that makes sense. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about adjectives or nouns functioning as adjectives, what is an adjective? Like, I don't get it, right? Well, adjectives describe nouns. They're words that describe nouns. Like I said earlier, whose laptop or which cat, which laptop, right? So adjectives actually are pretty interesting because they can come before a noun they can directly precede a noun. For example, a fluffy pillow. Pillow is a thing, can be made plural, etc. It's a noun. Well, which kind of pillow? A fluffy pillow, right? We could also have a white pillow or a hard pillow or an old pillow. So all of those words are describing which type of pillow. But they can also come after a state of verb. For example, so state of verbs, which we haven't talked about verbs yet, 
are things like to be, to seem, to feel like. For example, the blanket is warm. It's a warm blanket, right? The blanket is warm. So it comes after the verb to be. Same thing with fluffy pillow. It's a fluffy pillow. We could also say the pillow is fluffy. Okay, so they can come after state of verbs or they can come directly before the nouns. Adjectives are also stackable, which means you can use more than one adjective in a row to describe the same noun. They do have to go in a specific order, okay, for this to work. So for example, the active young black and white puppy. Our stacking adjectives are done in the following order. Opinion first, so like cute, active, funny, size. So is it big, small, um, fat, etc. Shape, round, straight, diagonal, etc. Condition, so young, old, um, threadbare, shabby, age. Age and condition are pretty similar because something being old is also its condition, like weak. Um, but age, if you're going for more specific, young, old, ancient, etc. Color, white, black, pink, yellow. Pattern, so checkered, uh, striped, polka dotted, and material cotton, silk, etc. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the order and you could literally have all of these in a row describing one noun. It's very rare, but it, it does happen. Um, and so we just kind of want to make sure that they're done in the correct order. So for example, the active young black and white puppy active is opinion. Young is, I mean, closer to age than condition. Sorry, I kind of mix them together because I associate oldness or youngness with certain conditions, which is just a preconceived notion, I guess. Um, and then black and white being the color, so that would come after the age. They cannot be made plural in the sentence, okay? So that's kind of what I was saying with the color pink. I chose the brown puppy. I can't say I chose the brown's puppy or brown's puppies, right? I cannot make the adjective plural. Um, it's just that's the adjective. And it can be preceded by an article or a determiner, uh, which those also can be considered adjectives in sentences sometimes um, because they're again describing the noun, but they're, they're determiners functioning as adjectives. So a brown puppy, the broken chair, etc. And quantifiers are also adjectives. So what I was saying earlier about like numbers, um, how much, how many, uh, are also considered adjectives describing the noun. So I put myself on an angle now to try and be fun. I don't know. I hope I'm not making you dizzy. Anyway, um, possessive adjectives are also adjectives. So this is going to be really interesting because some of you may have learned these as pronouns or types of pronouns. My, your, his, her, it's, our, their. They are not pronouns. They are possessive adjectives. So they're telling you which something, right? Like for example, my hero. Which hero? My hero. Or your hero, right? Um, which dog? His dog. Our dog, right? So these are again describing the nouns, which is what makes them adjectives. So looking at the same sentences that we looked at before for nouns, um, I've now bolded different words here. I've bolded what would be considered an adjective, describing the nouns that we saw in the previous slides. So there are six balls in the brown bag, right? So six is a quantifier. How many balls? That's an adjective. In which bag? The brown bag, right? Again, they're coming before the noun, describing the noun in some way. Um, and they're one of those what was it, seven or eight different types of adjectives that we talked about. Opinion, condition, material, age, color, etc. right? So those are all considered adjectives. My friend Molly has a feisty cat and a calm dog. So I changed this one a little bit to describe 
which type of cat she has and which type of dog she has. My friend Molly, right? So she's my friend. Whose friend? Mine. Um, but in this case, my is describing the word friend, right? My friend, it's a possessive adjective. My dad um, wants to purchase fish and place them in a large saltwater aquarium. So what kind of aquarium? Again, we have stackable adjectives here. Large and salt water. Large is the size. Salt water is like the um, material or type, right? So the salt water. King Arthur is famous. So now in this case, the adjective came after uh, the verb to be. Famous King Arthur. King Arthur is famous because his knights sat at a round table. Now you try. Identify the adjectives in the following sentences. So please pause here and identify as many adjectives as you can. And then once you press play, you'll get the answers. Ba -dum -ba -dum. Answers. So uh, we have soft, shiny, and silver. Hot and sunny. Some sweet, so some is a quantifier, right? How much and then sweet. Both are describing corn. Some is not describing sweet, right? It's not saying that only some of them were sweet um, or, so, or that it was somewhat sweet. It's saying that some corn, sweet corn, right? They're both describing corn. Some sweet corn, um, some juicy red strawberries, so some juicy and red. Soccer, because, okay, in this case, Joshua kicked the soccer ball. Um, again, soccer can be a noun, right? You can play soccer. It's a thing. Um, it's not made plural, but it is a thing that can be described like a... Um, hmm. How can you describe soccer without making it an adjective? You could say soccer is a fun sport, right? Um, so of course it can be used as a noun. However, in this case, it's describing which ball, right? Joshua kicked the soccer ball, that ball, the ball that is used for soccer. Uh, next, for the next field, quiet and smart. So how many did you get right? And we're finally on the topic of verbs. So verbs, you'll often be taught are actions. Oh, it's an action word, right? If it's an action, it's a verb. This is true. Things like walking, running, eating, jogging, jumping, these are all verbs. However, they can also be non-actions. For example, sleeping. Sleeping is not an action. You're not acting or moving, right? But it's still a verb. Uh, and they can be stative, like feeling and seeming and being, right? I am or I am not something. I seem to be or I feel something. Um, also to have possession, right, is a non-action. So I have something or I don't have something. How do we know it's a verb then? If it's, I mean, if it's an action, we say, yes, it's a verb. But if it's not an action, how can we be sure that it's a verb? Well, it, it's dictionary form, or it can have an infinitive form, which would start with the word to. For example, to sleep, to run, to eat, okay? Another thing we can do is see if we can change its tense. If you can change its tense in any given sentence, it's a verb. So that means, can you make it past, present, or future? For example, I slept well last night, or... Um, my daughter sleeps late at night. Um, the cat is sleeping right now. I will go to sleep in a few minutes, right? I can change the tense. So that means that it's a verb. Um, there are quite a few tenses in English, which I am not covering in this presentation, but I will cover all of the tenses in another presentation for you guys, okay? Um, and another way to know if something is a verb is if it can be described by an adverb. So that more specifically, usually an adverb of manner. Um, and I will talk about adverbs shortly and the different types of adverbs. 
Um, but if you can describe it with an adverb. So if you remember, adjectives describe nouns. Adverbs, notice it has the word verb in it, describe verbs. So for example, I slept well, right? How did I sleep? Or I slept heavily, meaning I was very tired and I slept well and heavily in a deep sleep. I snore loudly or someone snores loudly, right? How do they do it? They do it loudly. So how it's being done is um, an adverb describing it, okay? So if you can describe it with one of these adverbs, then that means it's a verb. If you're describing it with an adjective, it's a noun. If you're describing it with an adverb, it's a verb, okay? So looking at describing, not describing, sorry, identifying verbs in a sentence, same sentences that we had before, um, you're looking at if you can change the tense, you're looking at if it's an action or state, um, and you're looking at if it can be described by an adverb. So in the first case, we have there are six balls in the brown bag. Well, there are is a state, right? A state of being. There either are or are not. Therefore, it's most likely a verb. Um, we can also change the tense. There were six balls in the brown bag, but now they're gone, right? Um, stated verbs are a little bit difficult to describe with adverbs um, simply because they're not actions, right? So it's hard to describe how something can be or not be. Um, but again, just the fact that it's a stative or a state kind of gives you a hint towards the fact that it's a verb. My friend Molly has a feisty cat and a calm dog. Well, that is another non-action. It's possession to have or not have something. And it can be changed tense. My friend Molly had a feisty cat or will have a feisty cat and a calm dog. My dad wants to purchase fish and place them in a large saltwater aquarium. Well, want. We start with want, okay? We actually have a verb stem here. We have more than one verb. We have want and to purchase. So wants to purchase. Wants is that desire, right? And we can change the tense. Wanted, will want, has wanted, right? And to purchase is the infinitive form of purchase, right? We've put the word to in front of it. So this is a verb stem where we've joined two verbs together. He wants something. He wants to do something. He wants to purchase, okay? And then place again can be changed tense and placed them in a large saltwater aquarium, will place them in a large saltwater aquarium, has placed them in a large saltwater aquarium. So if we can change the tense again, likely a verb, and also to place something is kind of an, ac uh, an action, right? You're moving it. King Arthur is famous because his knights sat at a round table. Again, we have the state of to be. He is famous. And sat is an action, right? To sit or to stand. Um, and again, tense can be changed. Was famous, will be famous, has been famous. Sat, sit, will sit, etc. So as you saw in our previous slide examples, there was a verb stem, wants to purchase, right? Um, so there are some words, some verbs, sorry, that can act as what we call auxiliary verbs um, or helping verbs. Um, they help us change tense. They help us change voice, which I will also make separate presentations on because those are completely different concepts. Um, but they can also help us join more than one verb, okay? So some verbs cannot go together. Um, for example, like two actions is usually very difficult to put together. Uh, for example, like I walk ran or I walked to run, um, they start to sound kind of awkward, but especially things with desire, hope, feelings, um, and states, these can be joined with action verbs. Like I hope to become something, well become is more of a state I guess, but you're changing. Um, 
I hope to grow. I hope to live. I hope to catch, right? All these kinds of things. Um, we can join them because we have this kind of feeling uh, plus an action or state. But it's very difficult to put two of the same type of verb together is what I'm trying to say. Um, and in these cases, the, the verb stem has a main verb, which is the final verb in the string of verbs. Um, and then it has auxiliaries or helping verbs or other verbs that are kind of connected to that main verb, okay? But to focus on just auxiliary or helping verbs for now, um, we have a number of verbs in the English language that are often used as auxiliaries. They are to be, to have, to do, which is sometimes called dummy do, and modals, modal verbs such as would, will, could, can, should, etc., which I will talk about all of them in a minute. So all of these verbs can be placed in front of main verbs to help us change the tense. Um, or to help us change the voice. So we can have passive or active voice and we can have past, present, and future and all of the different tenses within that. So we have past perfect, present perfect, etc. Don't want to confuse you again. I will make a separate presentation on all of the tenses and the discussion between passive and active voice, voices, voice. But just to kind of give you an idea, if you have heard of these terms before, um, this might help you better understand, okay? So when do we use each auxiliary verb? So the auxiliary verb to be is often used to change the tense of the verb, um, and so is to have. So to be, we use, for example, it was raining yesterday. Um, I was sleeping when you called, etc. And we can also use it to change the voice or write in the passive voice. For example, the suspect was arrested. To have um, is used to change the tense of a verb, usually in the perfect tense. So to be is often used with progressive or continuous tenses. That's the I-N-G forms. To have is used often with perfect tenses. That's the E-N. Uh, or past participle form of the verb. For example, I have never been to Tokyo. And to do is often used in questions. For some questions, we can invert the subject and the verb. Um, and for some questions, usually yes or no questions, uh, we use the dummy do instead of if inverting the subject and verb. For example, if someone says, I like tomatoes, or you want to know if someone likes tomatoes, you would ask, do you like tomatoes, right? Um, it would not make sense to say, I mean, you could say colloquially, you like tomatoes, but it has this connotation of, depending on the context, like you, you would say it in a way like, you like tomatoes, like, ew, gross, right? Um, kind of asking, but not really asking, more of a rhetorical question or in surprise, like, you like tomatoes? Really? I didn't know that, right? Um, whereas if you're actually using the dummy do, do you like tomatoes? There is no connotation, right? I, I have no idea. I'm just asking you, do you? Yes or no, okay? So that's what we use the dummy do for. So if you're looking for an auxiliary verb in a sentence, you wanna look for more than one verb next to each other, so a string of verbs. And you want to look for the preceding to of an infinitive verb usually. Um, or you can also look for, again, the ing form of the verb or the en or past participle form of the verb. For example, I would like to go to the beach, right? So I've got would as my modal, like as my next verb, helping verb. And then what would I like to do? I would like to go. Um, I will travel, uh, again, will, changing the tense, being the modal um, of probability, and then what would or what will I do? I will travel. Mark should have done his homework instead of playing video games. I've got should, which is a modal, have, which is 
the auxiliary to, to have, and then done, which is the past participle form of the word, of the verb to do, um, which is the final action. So again, the final, sorry, I underlined by accident here instead of bolding. So this, this like should be in bold. Um, this should be underlined. Um, so I would like to go to the beach tomorrow. Um, what is the thing that's happening? What is the main verb going, right? I will travel to Spain next month. What is the main verb traveling? Mark should have done his homework. What is the main verb do, right? To do the homework. But I'm, I'm changing the meaning of these verbs or changing the time of these verbs by adding helping verbs in front of it, right? I would like something I want to do. I could also say I want to go to the beach tomorrow, right? Similar to how my dad wants to purchase, right? Again, helping kind of um, show a feeling or desire or hope for an action. I will travel is showing probability, right? I have an intention to travel to Spain next month. I have plans to travel to Spain next month. And I, I am thinking that I will go. However, there are, of course, external factors that may prevent my going, right? But the, the probability of it is very high. Mark should have done his homework expressing a kind of regret um, or like a need to have done something that he didn't do. Um, again, the main action is to do the homework, but I'm, I'm really expressing this kind of he didn't do it, right? He didn't do it, but I think that he should have done it. So a quick kind of overview of modals, because modals can be really confusing. Like what? I thought could and can mean the same thing. Like what's the difference between would and could and might? Here's a nice breakdown for you. Feel free to take note of this chart. The main difference between a number of modals is the tense of the modals. So we actually have past and present tense of the majority of our modal verbs. For example, could and can. Could is the past tense of can. Would and will. Would is the past tense of will. Should and shall. Should is the past tense of shall might and may, might is the past tense of may. Must and have to are the only ones that don't really have a past tense. Um, I mean, must, hmm, they can kind of be used as both past and present. Um, have to, you can change the tense of the word have. So you could say I had to do something, so that can be made past. Uh, but must itself, I'm just trying to think, I must, you you would have to use the verb have, I think, the auxiliary. Like, I must have done something in order to change the tense of that one. So it can be changed, but there's no specific word for it as there is with could and can and would and will, etc. So tense is the number one thing. Number two thing is what do they mean? When do you use which one? Okay, so each word, um, whether it's past or present, has a similar meaning generally. So for example, could and can both express ability. The ability to do or not do something, okay? Um, and could should be used in the past and can should be used in the present. So if it's an action that has already passed, you would say could. For example, I could not ride a bike when I was two, right? It's finished. I'm no longer two. When I was two, I could not ride a bike. Now I can ride a bike, right? So this is the ability I have now. Would and will are slightly different because they are used differently in the English language. So will is technically present tense. We say, I will go somewhere tomorrow, I will do something tomorrow, etc. But there is really no future tense in English. This is just a present form of the word would, 
uh, expressing probability, expressing the likelihood of something um, that will happen or that, that has not happened yet and there is a potential for it to happen, okay? It expresses a re relatively high likelihood of something happening or a plan of something happening. So when you see, um, for example, on the news, like it will rain tomorrow, uh, chances are that it's it's a high chance of it raining tomorrow. Um, if you see someone say, I will go to Spain next month, there's a high chance of them going. It's probably that they've already booked their flight, they've already you know, started preparing things, buying insurance, etc. So there is a high likelihood of it happening. However, because it has not happened yet, there is still that chance that it will not happen, that small chance. Wood, on the other hand, is past tense. Everything is finished with wood, right? So it can't have, it can't share that same meaning that it will has. So instead, we use it oftentimes for two different reasons. One, to express regret um, or something that you could have done that you wanted to do but didn't do um, or to be polite. So for example, oh, if you had told me that you were coming in my neighborhood, I would have invited you over, right? I wanted to. It's something that I... I liked to do. I wanted to invite you, but I didn't know you were here, so I didn't, and now I'm feeling sad or regret that I didn't invite you, and I'm letting you know I would have, okay? Or we can be polite with it. Would you please open the door? Would you please close the window, right? Um, can be done with will as well, I think. Will you please open the door? Will you please open the window? Um, however, even though this is not a past tense, it's just used to add politeness to the sentence. Then we have should and shall. So should expresses a need to do something um, or that something is kind of expected to be done. There can also be judgment um, or regret because again, this is something that's happened in the past um, in some cases. So if it's happened in the past, uh, there can be this kind of connotation of negativity attached to it. Like you should have or should not have done something, right? Meaning I'm judging you um, or I'm judging myself for not having or having done something or I'm feeling regret at having or not having done something um, because that thing was expected to have been done. If I'm using it in the present, like I should do my homework, I should clean the house, this is expressing a need to do something that's expected to be done, but it likely won't be done, right? So if I'm saying, yeah, I should clean the house, I'm kind of like, yeah, I know I have to do it. I know that I'm expected to do it, but I'm probably not going to do it, right? So there's this kind of idea that is attached to it, even though that's not necessarily in the past, right? Like I should clean the house. I'm thinking about doing it now. I know that I won't do it or I'm pretty sure that I won't do it, right? So um, this word, just because the modal is the past tense form or the present tense form of the verb doesn't necessarily mean that it's always used in the past or always used in the present. There are specific situations in which these words are used. And then shall expresses a willingness or a, a volunteering to do something. Um, like, I shall win the race means I have every intention, right? Like, this is what I am going to do. Um, I shall do my homework. I shall get an A on the test means I am really intending to do this, right? Like, this is my goal. I will do this. Um, for those of you who do speak Korean, uh, I find shall to have a similar, not same, it's not exactly the same, but a similar meaning to like, um, if I say, for example, 열심히 공부할게요, right, I'm really expressing this intention of I will study very hard, right, like I, I will, I shall, right, um, I have every intention of doing, so it's, it's kind of similar in that case. And then we have might and may. 
So both of these refer to there being kind of a 50-50 chance between things, right? Like it might rain tomorrow. Um, again, weird because might past tense, right? Um, however, in colloquial speech, you will hear them used interchangeably. So when I'm just speaking to someone, it is there is every chance that I will say, yeah, it might rain tomorrow versus it may rain tomorrow. Um, even though technically that's grammatically incorrect, uh, it is more grammatically correct to say it may rain tomorrow. Um, but for something that has just happened, for example, I could say like, oh, someone asked me, what, what was that noise? I could say, oh, it might have been the wind or it might be the wind, right? I'm, I'm referring to it already happened, like that sound already passed. So it might have been something. It's just in the English language, similar to in other languages, we like to shorten a lot of things. So it's very rare in colloquial speech to hear someone speak um, using like the present perfect or past perfect tense, unless it's a very specific situation. So although it might have been the wind is grammatically correct, um, most people would say something like, oh, it might be the wind. Maybe it was the wind, right? Like something like this. And then must or have to uh, express obligation, right? I must do something. I have to do something. Um, I must study in order to get an A. Um, I have to clean the house because it's a mess, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if it was in the past, you could say things like, I must have been tired because I fell asleep so easily, right? I must have been tired. It must be the case. It has to be the case that I was tired. Um, for have to, like I had to have been tired. Again, it's kind of weird because you're putting all these haves beside each other, but it is technically grammatically correct. And that's kind of how we use all the modals. So here are some examples of modal verbs in action. It could have been the wind or it could have been some kind of animal that knocked down our tree last night. Past tense, past tense of the of the word, of the modal. Um, and again, 50-50 chance, right? We don't know. Sally can ride a unicycle, or sorry, in that case, not 50-50 chance. In that case, um, we don't know. It's just the ability, right? It's just the ability of it could have been something. Sally can ride a unicycle. Unfortunately, her little brother cannot. Sometimes he feels jealous of Sally. So ability, she has the ability to ride a unicycle. Her brother does not. Would you be so kind as to open the door for me? Sorry, my hands are full. Um, being polite, would you be so kind? Please. You may hear people also say, could you open the door for me? But again, um, for people who are kind of like very sensitive about grammar um they'll be like I don't know can I right because it it expresses this ability idea of ability or notion of ability um it's almost like you're asking is it possible for you like do you have the ability to do so um versus if you say would you be so kind as to open the door or would you please open the door um you're kind of asking about the person's willingness to open the door and being polite about it so that's a little more appropriate Again, though, you will hear people say, even like students in classrooms, can I go to the bathroom versus may I go to the bathroom, etc. I would have been able to go to Sam's party if I had finished my homework yesterday. So again, expressing this kind of like regret almost, like I would have been able to go, but I didn't do my homework, so I couldn't. Jim and Julie will go see a Shakespeare play at Stratford this weekend. So they have a plan or intention to do so. Um, and there's just like a very small chance that it won't happen, that some external force will prevent them from going. And according to the news, it will rain tomorrow. So again, a high probability of it raining, but of course, mother nature is unpredictable and there is still a chance of this, um, weather forecast being incorrect. And a few more, we really should go home now. It looks like there's going to be a thunderstorm expressing the kind of need or expectation to do something. Um, you know, we should go, not that we necessarily have to, but we should, I think we should. I should have studied harder for that science exam, expressing some kind of regret, probably didn't do so well on the exam. 
I shall memorize my lines in time for the play, expressing intention, um, desire. It might or may be a snow day tomorrow. Wouldn't that be exciting? So again, um, it may be a snow day tomorrow is more grammatically correct. However, in colloquial speech, you will hear people say it might be a snow day tomorrow. So they can both be used. Wouldn't that be exciting? Asking the question of like, what do you think, right? Would it, would it, or would it not? Um, kind of asking probability in this case, will you feel excited or will you not feel excited if that happens? May I come in? Um, asking permission. Joan's mother told her she must clean her room if she wants to go to the beach next weekend, expressing obligation. Sorry, I can't come to the movies today. I have to go to my mother, grandmother's 90th birthday again, expressing obligation. Of course, there is a choice in each of these cases. You always have a choice. Um, however, your choice, um, you probably don't like the consequences um, if you don't do what is expected of you or what kind of there's this obligation for you to do. And here is some modal practice. So can you please read the sentences and fill in the blanks with what you think is the most appropriate modal and why? Just pause the video here for a minute and do your absolute best. And when you click play again, you will get the answers. Answer time. So for the first one, according to the weather forecast, there's a 50% chance of rain tomorrow. Therefore, it may or might rain tomorrow. Both are fine because as I noted before, it is grammatically correct to use the present tense modals for present or future situations and past for situations that have already happened. However, in colloquial speech, they are often used interchangeably. I really regret not studying more for the test. I should have studied harder expressing regret would or will you please hold the door open for me my hands are full I have no experience riding a motorcycle therefore I cannot ride a motorcycle I have no ability in order to drive a car the car must or has to have gas if it doesn't have any the car won't go anywhere this is expressing obligation now the main verb as I mentioned earlier um, is the final verb in a string of verbs, okay? So you'll have some auxiliaries or some other verbs in front of it, but the main verb is the last one in that string of verbs. For example, Mark should have done his homework. In that case, to do, done, is the main verb. I would like to go to the beach. In that case, go, to go, is the main verb. The main verb tells you what's happening in the sentence. Now, as this video is already quite long, um, I think adverbs is the last thing I'm going to cover for part one. I'll, I'll break it down into two parts. So part one, um, adverbs, the last thing I'll cover, and then we'll talk about the other stuff in part two. So what are adverbs? I've mentioned this before. Adverbs describe verbs um, more often than not, but they can also sometimes describe adjectives. Uh, and can modify an entire sentence if they're adverbs of time, for example. Um, they usually end in ly, but not always. This is because we can add the suffix ly to many adjectives to turn them into adverbs. For example, if a person is kind, we can say they do things kindly, right? If a person is awkward, we can say that they speak awkwardly or present themselves awkwardly, right? So we're just adding ly to the adjective. Um, um, some other examples, quiet becomes quietly, Jane is a quiet girl versus Jane speaks quietly. But there are also some adjectives that end in ly, so we shouldn't confuse these with adverbs, okay? For example, friendly. Friendly is actually an adjective. I'm a friendly person, right? Or my sister is friendly. Um, not that he or she is doing something in a friendly way. Uh, and those adjectives cannot be made adverbs by an, uh, adding ly because they already have ly at the end of them. Then we also have um, to further describe what is an adverb, that they usually describe time, place, manner, frequency, and or degree. So some other examples of adverbs include things like tomorrow, above, sweetly, often, and almost. Careful with some adverbs like 
under, above, because they can also be prepositions um, depending how they're used in a sentence, but they are also considered adverbs if you look up um, like what, what classification they have. Generally, adverbs of time and frequency, so those are things like tomorrow, often, almost, mm, not so much almost, almost is more degree, but more like tomorrow, often, sometimes. Um, these adverbs uh, can freely move about the sentence. What this means is we can, because they modify the whole sentence usually, uh, we can place them either at the beginning or at the end, and the whole sentence will still make sense. For example, they don't, um, for example, Susan said we will go to the beach tomorrow. What tomorrow is modifying is when we will go to the beach. And I'm giving you reported speech. I'm giving you Susan said something. So it's not modifying what Susan said, it's modifying, sorry, it's not modifying Susan and the fact that she's speaking. It's modifying the words that she said, we will go to the beach tomorrow. So Susan said, we will go to the beach tomorrow, or Susan said, tomorrow we will go to the beach, both make perfect sense, okay? Now, if I had have said tomorrow, Susan said, we will go to the beach, if there's no commas there, it might mean that Susan is going to say this tomorrow, but then it's in the past tense and it gets rather confusing. However, if I said tomorrow, comma, Susan said, comma, we will go to the beach, then that would make more sense. We'd probably have quotation marks around her speech, um, just kind of inserting the reported words, the words that are showing that I'm reporting her speech in different places. Um, and as I said, these adverbs can move freely throughout the sentence because they modify entire clauses or sentences rather than just one verb or one adjective, for example. And just a little bonus for you guys, intensifiers are also considered adverbs or adverb phrases. Um, so an intensifier is a word that weakens or strengthens another word, usually the word that comes after it. Um, we can also put more than one intensifier next to each other to increase the impact even more. Um, and some examples of these words are things like two, not two like the direction, two with two O's, so extremely, absolutely, and totally. Um, you'll notice that a lot of these also end in L-Y, hinting that they are adverbs, right? Um, and so I, for example, I have way too many skirts in my closet. Um, the, ad, the adjective is, in this case, a quantifier, many, right? Describing the noun skirts, many skirts. How many skirts? I have way too many, right? So I'm describing using these intensifiers that it's more than many. It's so much. It's a lot, maybe too much. The waitress was so rude. Okay, the adjective is rude, describing the waitress, right? And I am intensifying this adjective by using so. And then I am absolutely shocked that Jim and Jane broke up. So in this case, it's not a verb. This is a tricky one. In this case, it's still an adjective because I am describing what I am or who I am. I am shocked. I am tired. I am happy, right? So it is still an adjective. And how shocked am I? I'm absolutely shocked, right? So Again, it's that kind of adverb of manner, intensifying, making stronger um, the feeling of being shocked. So identifying adverbs in a sentence, um, we just gonna do the same, we are just going to do the same thing that we did with nouns, verbs, and adjectives before this. Ask ourselves all of the questions that were in the previous slides. Does the word fit? Okay, now remember that not every single word will fit perfectly with all of the criteria. We're looking for more than like 95% of the criteria. We're looking for the majority of the criteria to be met in that sentence for it to qualify as that part of speech, okay? So the sun shone brightly through the window. Brightly ends in L-Y. So already we have an idea that it may be an adverb of manner. It's describing the word shone, right? 
uh, which is the past tense of to shine. It's describing this word here. So if it's describing Sean, which is the past tense of to shine, we know that shine is a verb and brightly is describing a verb, which makes it a adverb. I promised my sister I would take her to the park tomorrow. Okay, so now we have tomorrow. Tomorrow is modifying the whole sentence. When is this happening? It's an adverb of time. Can I move it freely throughout the sentence? Yes, I can say tomorrow I promised my sister I would take her to the park or I promised my sister tomorrow I would take her to the park. I promised my sister I would take her to the park tomorrow, right? So all of these fit. It's modifying the entire sentence and it makes sense no matter where I move this word. With exceptions, of course, we can't put it in between verb strings, for example, or in between a subject and verb. Um, but relatively free moving, whereas most other parts of speech need to be in a specific place in the sentence or it won't make sense. My dog urinates outside. So I'm talking about where now. It's an adverb of place. Where does my dog urinate? Um, well, he urinates outside. And I can move this freely about the sentence. I can say my, well, I could say if I move it here, I would have to add another word, but I could say outside is where my dog urinates, right? Um, and that would still make sense. So it does work. It does relatively, it is able to be moved around. Now, if you're really unsure, you can test it out to see if it fits in other parts of speech. So for example, can you make it plural? Um, can you do other things with it? If you can't uh, change its tense, et cetera, et cetera, and it doesn't fit in the other parts of speech, then chances are it's going to fit better into the part of adverb, right? So you can also play around with them in that way if you're not sure. John goes to the bar often, again, an adverb of, um, this one's like a frequency, right? How often, when, sometimes, always, often. Um, and dinner is almost ready, a kind of like degree in this case, right? So it's not quite ready yet. So in this case, almost is describing ready, which is, um, an adjective in this case describing dinner, right? Dinner is ready, Did, dinner is almost ready. Well, what parts of speech describe adjectives? Adverbs. So adverbs do generally describe verbs. However, they can also describe adjectives, especially when they're intensifiers. So adverbs in practice. So can you find all of the adverbs in this paragraph? Again, please pause the presentation, pause the video here, and see if you can find all of the adverbs. Remember that we have different kinds of adverbs, adverbs of manner, frequency, time, place, degree. So look very carefully and ask yourself all of the questions. And then on the next slide, when you press play again, you'll see what the answers were. And here are the answers in purple. So we've got slightly describing taller, We've got incredibly describing strict. We've got very describing intimidating. We've got well describing how she taught. Extremely describing knowledgeable. Very describing informative. And traditionally describing again how she taught. Hello. Please make sure you like and subscribe. Bye bye everyone.